Good evening and happy holidays. Welcome to our Caltech Associates events this evening, Powering the Future with AI, with Professor Yi Song Yu. I am Betty Huang, Caltech Associates President. It is wonderful to see new and familiar names logging in with us today. Yi Song has graciously offered to stay on for an associate members only Q&A. Therefore, no questions will be taken during the public presentation. Associate members were sent an email with the Zoom meeting ID, password, and link. If you are an associate members but didn't receive our message, please contact us by email now to associates at caltech.edu. We want to make sure you get all the information because this is a very special for members only Q&A and you can ask Isan questions directly. I would like to take this moment now to tell everybody a little bit about our unique organization. The associates have proudly supported Caltech since 1926. Now we have more than 2000 associate members worldwide. We host several events a year for our members who include Caltech parents, alumni, friends, entrepreneurs, and people just like you who are interested in science and technology. We learn about Caltech's world-changing discoveries and innovations, even better. We hear the news directly from researchers themselves, many of whom are Nobel laureates. Through membership, we raise unrestricted funds for Caltech's cutting edge scientific researches. We empower Caltech's president and provost to fund what's most important. Just to say a few, this type of flexible funding is especially critical now as Caltech researchers address COVID-19. And just to say a few things like um, including antibodies research to develop future treatments, create models to more effectively track the spread of the disease and develop sensors to quickly detect if a person was infected. Now, it is my privilege to introduce Professor Yi Song Yu. Yi Song joined the Caltech faculty in 2014 after working on sports analytics and data-driven animation at Disney Research. His research is focused on statistical machine learning with a special focus on learning with humans in the loop. He is the co-director of DOSIT, which pushes the boundaries of knowledge in data-driven intelligent systems. And he is also a scientific advisor for CAST, a Caltech center that focuses on how robots and drones learn and think now. Isan. Thank you, Betty, for the introduction. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. Um, today, I think we'll start off with a, a fun poll to get the audience involved. And you should be seeing the poll momentarily. Ah, there it is. So the poll is, what are you most looking forward to having AI do for you in the future? Cook meals, drive cars, provide companionship, help converse with people speaking other languages. Now, if you feel so compelled, you can choose more than one of these options. We'll give you about a minute to decide. And I think these options are quite different and they offer very different ways that our lives can be transformed through the help of AI in the future. Some of these will transform us in ways of convenience and um, chores such as cooking meals, others and transportation, others are more social in nature such as conversing and companionship. So I think these are very different ways and uh, with different uh, ways that they can impact us. So I think uh, if you are still making up your mind, uh, please make your selections in the next few seconds. We'll be um, closing down the poll soon. And the answers are number one, drive cars. Number two, help converse with people in speaking other languages. And the other two uh, in distance, third and fourth. So it seems like we have two winners. Uh, I'm Pretty optimistic that uh, self-driving cars will be available, at least in some limited capacity, in the foreseeable future. So that's very exciting. 
And conversational AI uh, for translation, I think is also on the horizon as well. So these, uh, for those of you who are excited about these two technologies, uh, just uh, hold on tight for, for a little while longer and uh, hopefully it'll be there soon. So today I'll be spending a little bit of time with all of you talking about how to power the future with AI Caltech style. So the first question is, uh, what is machine learning? So machine learning and AI, artificial intelligence are used very synonymously right now. But I would say that machine learning, which is a subset of artificial intelligence, technically speaking, is sort of the driver of a lot of the recent excitement. So machine learning is the process of converting data and experience into knowledge. Data are the things that we've all become very uh, experienced with uh, in this day and age. Com a knowledge is expressed in the form of a computer model or a piece of software. And the process is a computer algorithm, uh, another software that runs on the data and produces an artifact, a computer artifact called a model. What is machine learning used for? It's actually used in a lot of different ways, some of which you may even find surprising or unexpected. So recommender systems um, use a lot of machine learning based off it, what it based on predictions of what it thinks you might be interested in. Computational advertising, probably arguably the first major financial or commercial success of machine learning that does targeted advertising based off some match of the content you're searching for with an estimation of your interest in the content of the ad. Spam detector, the first uh, commercial deployment of machine learning to my knowledge, that automatically predicts if an email is spam or not. If you ever look in your spam folder, you know, it's not perfect, but you know, it definitely helps a lot. Uh, Speech recognition, if we all talk to our phones and the, the ability to recognize audio and transcribe it into text is done largely through machine learning. Uh, Q&A, question answering. This is a little bit more of an experimental technology, although if you search for specific types of questions on Google, Google can actually expose you directly and answer without point, having to point you to a web page first. Uh, matchmaking, so what you see bottom is a, a matchmaking system for um, Halo uh, by Microsoft. Um, 3D detection. So this is the Xbox um, uh, 3D detector that can de register detect 3D poses from camera. Self-driving cars. The Mars rover is, uh, and space autonomy is increasingly thinking about using AI to um, uh, increase automation. Robotics, home robotics, sports analytics. I'll talk about that later in the talk animation, uh, clinical assistance in the bottom left. I'll talk about that later as well, using AI to help guide clinicians in making better choices for treatments and therapies, uh, behavior analysis, and medical analysis. So these are all areas where we have lots of data and we can use machine learning to process this data to help us make better decisions. So the success of machine learning that we've seen so far has really been about the success of supervised learning. So what supervised learning and works is as follows. We have raw data, text, gene sequences, videos, et cetera. We have some kind of signal uh, that we're trying to learn. For instance, it could be the rating of a movie as a function of the contents of the movie. It could be um, whether or not a gene encodes a certain function. There's some signal that we want to predict. This is called the supervision. Often it requires annotation or expensive experimentation to acquire, but that's the thing we want to predict. And we have a lot of both. We put both into a computer, we run a machine learning algorithm, and we produce a model uh, that makes predictions on inputs from the raw data to the signal. So for those of you who are familiar with some of the terminology, uh, deep neural networks is, a, is such a model that is trained on lots of data to make a prediction of the target signal given the raw data. So to maybe ground the conversation, let's look at one of the applications that I worked on, which is a data-driven speech animation. So the basic idea here is that we want a machine learning algorithm to automatically synchronize the animation of the lips or mouth of a character to spoken audio rather than having an artist tediously do it by hand. And let's see here. So here's an example. So all the speech animation in this uh, animation is done automatically using our approach. Do I look funny to you? I may be a chimp, but I'm dressed better than you.
I'm a PhD specialising in computer graphics and facial animation. But at night, I'm a level 10 operative for a secret organisation. But we are now on different frequencies. My speech is pretty good, don't you think? Meu português ainda melhor, não acha? Okay. So, let's think about um, exactly how this works. And this is going to be a little bit of math, but not too much. And hopefully it just gives you a sense of what's going on uh, in terms of the technical details. Um, so, the input, the raw data, is a sequence of phonetics, like the International Phonetic Alphabet. The output is some configuration, like a puppet configuration of a face. And the goal is to learn this model that can say, given this input of phonetics, how should I uh, move the pup, this virtual puppet face? And so here's the one example where uh, this is at 30 hertz. So, the, so it's, uh, it's resolving the phonetics at 30 frames per second. And you, what you see in the raw input is the frame by frame phonetic decomposition of the word prediction. And what you see here is one of the puppet strings of this virtual puppet mouth that is that controls how wide open the mouth is. So as you start saying the word prediction, the mouth sharply opens, stays wide open, closes to about half open, stays there for a while, then closes some more. So we want to train a deep neural net given lots of the data of this form to even make these predictions automatically so that we can do automatic data-driven lip sync. Once we have that approach, we can fit it into a standard animation pipeline. So you have your input audio, which is in uh, sound waveforms. You process that using off-the-shelf speech recognition, such as that available on your phone, to get phonetics. You feed that into our approach uh, to get data-driven lip syncing on a reference face puppet. And then you can retarget that face puppet to any other animated character. And then you can import that animation into editing software that movie animation artists use to add other expressions like smiling and nodding in addition to the high frequency speech animation that we produce automatically. So that's how the pipeline works. And because we operate at the level of phonetics, uh, we are actually largely language agnostic. As, as long as you can recognize uh, phonetics from you know, any language, our approach can work. So here's some examples. Deutsche Wörter sind sehr viel länger als englische Wörter. Mal sehen, ob das trotzdem funktioniert. Jeśli kiedykolwiek będziesz odwiedzał Polskę, polecam Kraków. Mama Dalda Maliga Wendimata Senusurada Hause Gemi. Niemand Jen Taoyan. Chirbala, Hodzula, Jo Zona Kamo Shohua. We could also do singing. Somewhere over the rainbow, way up high, and the dreams that you've dreamed of once in a lullaby. Oh, Danny boy, the pipes, the pipes are calling from glen to glen and down the mountainside. What's great about this approach is that the lip syncing for something like this might take an animation artist hours to do at 30 frames per second. But our approach, trained on lots of data, uh, can basically do this you know, in less than a second. So that saves the artists a lot of time because lip syncing is not something that they particularly enjoy. Okay, moving on to things that are more Caltech-y. So here at Caltech, I've had the great pleasure and privilege to have collaborated with many scientists and engineers to help them solve some pressing needs in their fields. One that I particularly enjoyed is a collaboration with Men and Zach, who are seismologists in the GPS division, on using machine learning to augment uh, various seismology questions. One of them is better earthquake detection and catalog. So what you see on the left is a depiction in terms of the green triangles of all the sensing stations in Southern California. And what you see in the black dots are all the events that have been recorded for about the past four to five decades. And that's a lot of data. And so, um, 
what the seismologists have done is painstakingly annotated a significant fraction of this data. Uh, and so the raw data, the X, are the seismometer readings from the various stations. And the Y, the, 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 the target signal, are these ground truth earthquake events that have been painstakingly annotated. What we hope to do, and which we have done, is to train a deep neural net on this data, 40 years of data, to automatically detect earthquake events from seismometer readings. And we actually have uh, a few approaches already developed. If you're so inclined, you can visit my website or Zach's website to find the papers that talk about them. A few of them have been published already. And this saves seismologists a lot of time when they're going about their day in terms of catalyze, cataloging and analyzing earthquake patterns. Another example, uh, which is a collaboration with my colleague Pietro Perona, is on behavior modeling. So there are many uh, scientists, typically biologists at Caltech, who study the behavior of animals, uh, typically after inducing some condition on them, such as a uh, hyperstimulating part of their brain or some other uh, effect, and then seeing how that affects behavior. You can think of behavior as the most complex phenotype. And so analyzing it is very important. However, cataloging behavior is very tedious in the traditional way of doing so, because you actually have to count how many times, in this case, a male fly is chasing a female fly in the Petri dish. Uh, and, and then you know, using those counts to do further scientific analysis, that's what's, that's what's useful for biology. There can be now be hours and hours of videos produced by a single biology experiment. And so it can be very valuable to train a machine learning approach on this data to be able to automate some of this cataloging. And so the different types of behaviors that one might want to annotate and then automatically predict are those that you've seen here, such as touching, wing threats, et cetera. And hopefully if a biologist is willing to annotate some of these, which they would have to do anyways, by the way, for their analysis, then all that data can be reused to train a machine learning algorithm to automate a significant fraction of this in the future. And of course, Pietro has a longstanding collaboration with biologists and that some of these are already being used today. Uh, another collaboration is with Sarah Reisman from uh, CCE, where the inputs are uh, a reaction of interest. That's what you see on the left. I have, a, I have a molecule. I want to get the modify the molecule to produce a different molecule. So I want to, I want to instigate or catalyze a reaction. The goal then is to predict what is the catalyst that will catalyze this reaction, and that's the output Y. And so, you know, people have done uh, large amounts of experiments of this form. You have huge databases uh, of this form. And so you just take this data and then you throw it into a machine learning approach. That's the black box you see in the middle. Uh, some of them are deep neural networks, some of them other machine learning approaches. And then now you have a model that can make these predictions that helps guide the chemist's decision-making when trying to design or, or, or optimize for a new chemical reaction workflow. And this paper was, uh, has been submitted for publication at a chemistry journal. Okay, so those are some really exciting stories. And those were, I would call them success stories in the sense that they have delivered a machine learning tool that is useful for a, chem for a scientist or an engineer's workflow. But there are many, many other collaborations that I work on where out of the box machine learning doesn't work so well. And we would like to improve them. And so here's a non-exhaustive list of challenges for modern AI that, have, that I have come across in my collaborations that inspired the, the more fundamental AI research that my lab conducts uh, in collaboration with all these scientists and engineers. And the four that I like to think about are, A, what if the data description is incomplete in some way? The second one is, what if the supervised labels that are so crucial to getting this whole process working, what if they're not available or only a little bit of them are available. The next one is, what if the prediction space is very, very complex, much more complex than is there a lunge in this video or not, yes or no? And the last one is, what if we need to certify other properties? For instance, many, many learning-based approaches are now being used in society in a way that affects humans directly. And we often want to audit, be able to audit or certify that these systems are behaving in a way that is not harmful to humans. So how do we actually do that when the contemporarily popular deep learning approaches are so hard to certify? 
So let's start with the first one, and I'll give some examples of my collaborations as we walk through these challenges. So the first challenge is what if the data description is incomplete? So um, here's uh, one of the applications that I worked on in collaboration with uh, ESPN and Disney Research and a company called Stats, which is a sports analytics tech company. And the motivating application is a technique called ghosting. Ghosting is a term used in sports analytics to describe how to analyze a replay where your team on defense lost or got scored upon. And so what the coaches would do in ghosting is they would annotate frame by frame a, a replay sequence where your team got scored on and they would, they would annotate where the defenders should have been to have defended the play better. This is very valuable because defense is a team activity. You really need to know how the team should have behaved. But this is also very tedious because now coaches are being asked to do this very laborious manual annotation. So we asked the question, can we do data-driven ghosting? So train a neural net to automatically do ghosting. And that's what you see here where the white players are our are, are ghosting uh, results from a deep neural network trained on data. What made this problem interesting from those fundamental AI challenges perspective is that if you take an off the shelf AI tool and applied it to this data set, you would get a result that looks like this. And this is essentially, I would call this a bunch of seven-year-olds playing soccer or football, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, it's not really useful. And so what's the problem? The problem is the way you represent the raw data. So normally, when you, the way you would represent the raw data in an, in, a, in an application like this is you would have a coordinate system. Where's the goalkeeper? Then where's the left back? Then where's the left center back? Then where's the right fielder? And so on and so forth. And, and you would have this sort of basically this way of representing the world. And then that's what you provide to the deep neural net. Unfortunately, we don't actually know who the left back is. We don't know who the left center back is. And if you talk to coaches and sports analysts, they'll tell you that whoever plays the role of left back or left center back can swap dynamically during a gameplay sequence. So it's not a static concept. In other words, our description of the world is incomplete. What we have is an unordered set of trajectories. We don't know who's, who belongs to which role. That description is not in this data set. The raw data doesn't contain the full complete description needed to actually apply conventional AI approaches. And so the naive approach that performed so poorly, the off the shelf approach ignored this issue. And so my former PhD student Huang, uh, uh, and I'll just, uh, won't go into the details, developed an approach that can automatically fill in this missing data to infer the roles automatically while also applying standard off-the-shelf machine learning approaches uh, in a unified approach. And once you do that, you can actually resolve this problem and get the ghosting, data-driven ghosting solution that I showed you in the first video. Interestingly enough, you can also visualize what the roles, what, what roles were inferred. So this data was trained on the entire 2012-2013 English Premier League season, which is one of the top uh, soccer or football leagues in Europe. And here you see a visualization of the roles that were inferred. And so from this description, you can see that the dominant defensive formation during that season in the English Premier League is 4-4-2. Okay, moving on. The next challenge is what if the supervised labels are not available or expensive to acquire? So, the type of supervised learning that I just described to you that has been so successful is a form of learning called batch or passive learning. In this case, all the data is collected up front. So we have this large data description of the raw data X. We have this large data set of the target signals associated with the raw data Y. We feed all of this into a learning algorithm to get a neural net classifier. And then it works a lot of the time. But what if this data was not available? 
So let me talk about some of the applications that I worked on here at Caltech where the data is not available up front. In such cases, uh, we can think of this not as passive learning, but rather as interactive learning. This happens often in experiment design, where the goal of experiment design is to plan for how to collect the data. And so you have an experiment designer, typically a human, although increasingly an algorithm, such as those that my group develops. It plans an experiment on some platform. The experiment runs, and we get a measurement, the Y, back. And then we repeat. And so this is an iterative and adaptive or interactive, if you will, learning problem where we're choosing what data to collect, collecting that data, learning a little bit, and then, and then uh, repeating. And the goal here is to be able to, of course, be make the best use of the budget that we have because running these experiments can be very expensive or time consuming. And so there are many applications uh, for this way of using machine learning, which is not the standard one that has become so popular in the uh, commercial sector. And they have applications in tuning, automatically tuning controllers and robots, drug discovery, protein design, material science design, and many, many others. So one example that I like to talk about is my collaboration with my colleague, Joe Burdick, and our former postdoc, Yanan, who's now a professor at Tsinghua, on treating spinal cord injury patients. So the subject you see here on the bottom right, uh, he had an injury to his lower back and he no longer has the ability to stand or walk of his own power. He's effectively paralyzed. What Joel and his collaborators have been working on is this using this Medtronic epidural electrostimulator array, implanting it inside the spinal column, close to the spinal cord, and this, and this array induces an electromagnetic field or a neuromodulation that hopefully can help this patient or subject regain some lower limb mobility. The problem, of course, is that every patient is unique. Their injury is unique. Their physiology is unique. There's even variability or uniqueness in where exactly this device is implanted. And so we really need to collect data per subject in order to train our models. And there are many, many ways that we can collect this data because there are many ways to configure this device. And none of the data is available a priori. And so this is how you would think of an interactive learning setup. You have your algorithm that applies a stimulus. That's our description X. We see how well the patient is standing in this case. That's our target response Y. We update our law model. We do some sort of machine learning model that's standard. And then we repeat. That's the process. And this process has been, uh, I would say, surprisingly successful. So um, here's a result in, in a clinical setting where our approach was used very successfully to help doctors guide the decision-making in this context. And so here's a patient who has been injured and unable, unable to stand of his own power for about two years, standing for the first time with the help of this type of AI approach. Okay, the same idea can be used to personalize other therapies for people who have lower body injuries, such as personalizing the gait on a lower body exoskeleton to help them uh, achieve a gait that they find most comfortable. We use a very similar technique to on a completely different platform. Instead of neuromodulation, it's a, a lower body exoskeleton, but the same AI algorithm applied. Another example is in nanophotonic structure design. So this is a collaboration with Harry Atwater's group, who is a faculty here at Caltech. And the basic idea is as follows. So the, in the figure on the left, you see basically a photon well. A photon gets trapped in this well, and then the slit at the bottom only allows a certain wavelength of light through. It's essentially a camera sensor. There are many different parameters of this, of this sensor. And the different parameters control for what wavelength of light gets sent through, the signal to noise ratio, the sensitivity, so on and so forth. And you could put these together into these super pixels you see on the bottom right to make next generation cameras. The most immediate application of this, excuse me, the most immediate application of this is in hyperspectral imaging, where you can have where you can do very fine-grained narrow wavelength uh, analysis of um, 
of various phenomena such as vegetation, earth, that you cannot do with a simple RGB channel, three channel camera. So the problem of course, is that we don't know without running an experiment, what this particular configuration of this camera sensor is good for. So what's typically done is you have a configuration on the left, you simulate it using a, using a high fidelity physics simulation, and you get something that looks like the thing on the right, which is a transmission profile from a low uh, from small wavelength light to to large wavelength light. So from basically uh, near ultraviolet to near infrared. And this particular uh, camera sensor is very good at filtering light at 550 nanometers. And so that's the outcome of the experiment. And so if we want to design camera sensors, we need to be able to collect data of this form, but we don't have that data up front. And so what we did was we developed an algorithm to help Harry's group figure out how to collect data efficiently. So you have a camera, camera design, which is these parameters of this photon well. You choose a design, you choose a simulation. Uh, so there's cheaper simulations, more expensive simulations. The cheaper ones are um, less accurate. The expensive ones are very accurate. And you get a response, like what is the transmission profile of light that gets, that gets passed through the slit at the bottom? You update your machine learning model and you repeat. That's the basic idea. And this has been applied very successfully to help Harry's group accelerate their uh, design process for nanophotonics. Another application that I collaborate on is in protein design. So this is largely a collaboration with Francis Arnold's group uh, in CCE in the chemical and chemical engineering division at Caltech. And the basic idea is again, very similar. Uh, the, the raw space X is the space of all proteins in this design space, which is in this case represented as amino acid chains. The response variable Y is the fitness measurement of this protein. So what you actually have to do is you literally have to choose a protein and an amino, amino acid chain, synthesize it in the wet lab, measure its fitness, that's your data for machine learning. And now you need to choose a new protein to synthesize. So the same idea, very exciting application. Okay, switching topics a little bit. Another place where um, data can be expensive to acquire is when you have a lot of raw data, like here we have videos of animals behaving. And, but the annotations, like what activity or behavior is um, present in the video needs to be done manually by an expert, in this case, a biologist or a biology PhD student. And so the biggest bottleneck in, in this kind of domain, where you have a lot of raw data, but the annotation needs to be done via some sort of manual inspection is the annotation. So if you have hours and hours of video, of raw video like this, then you know a biologist would need to basically watch every second of this video and annotate it in order to use that analysis for their actual science or nature project. And so how can we reduce the annotation burden needed uh, from the biologist side? Because um, they would much rather not be spending time annotating. And so we have been hard at work trying to figure out how to get the most annotation efficient machine learning approaches possible. Uh, here's just one result we got. A uh, note that the X and Y axes are all on a log scale, so they're increased by factors of 10. And what this and the dotted uh, horizontal line basically means that with our new approach, you can get the same accuracy as the current approach with one tenth the number of annotations. So a, what used to take almost a million frames of annotations on the biology side to get this accuracy now takes only 100,000. It's a huge amount of savings in terms of annotation effort on the side of the biologist who really should be spending their time on more you know, uh, intellectually um, fulfilling pursuits. So we're very excited about this result. Okay, the third challenge is what if the prediction space is very complex? And so, uh, here's, an, here's a challenge uh, done by uh, mostly by my colleague, David Van Villen in BBE in the, in the biology and biolog biological engineering division and a postdoc that we jointly co-advised, Uriah Israel. And the basic idea is that 
um, we want to be able to do tissue level analysis of plates of cells. In this case, to analyze, um, you know, the, the first, of course, which cells are tumorous, and then based on the structure of the, of the spatial relationships, make further downstream um, analysis as well. And so if you look at this plate of cells, we're, we're, we're classifying not just the type of a single cell, but collectively classifying the types of every cell uh, on this plate. And there are, I don't know, there are thousands of cells on this plate. So that is a much more complicated task than just classifying a single cell independently. So that's an example of complex predictions. Another example is forecasting. So forecasting of behaviors is actually a very interesting uh, problem. You could also think of it as a form of content generation, where if we can forecast future behaviors, we can use that in a range of domains, such as reasoning about um, behaviors of people driving for self-driving car companies, or to reason about um, how to design video games where people can behave in a way that looks realistic. Here's an application where my student, Eric, studied how to forecast behaviors of basketball players trained on real NBA behavior data. And so here we show both the low level behaviors, the trajectories, plus the goals that the, each player is trying to achieve. Here's another example. So this is trained on hundreds of games of NBA uh, from, from the NBA from the 2012, 2013 season. You could even do various forms of probabilistic reasoning, such as in this condition, what are the likely places that the green player will go to? And you can, you can use this model to actually do this uh, repeated forecasting to get a sense of the spread of the distribution of possible outcomes. Okay, the final challenge that I want to talk about today is what if we need to certify other properties such as safety? This is actually, uh, I, I would say that this is actually the direction that uh, my lab is most focused on out of, out of all four. So I'll start with a quote. Um, an aerospace director visited Caltech about five years ago, and he said this to me, uh, basically verbatim. He said, Yisong, I want to use deep learning to optimize the design, manufacturing, and operation of our aircrafts. But... I need some guarantees. So what guarantees might this aerospace director be thinking about? Well, uh, guarantees include things like stability. I don't want my airplane to destabilize. I, I think we can all, I think we all think that that's important. Safety. I want to make sure that if there's a performance envelope that my airplane is flying in, it doesn't leave this performance envelope. Smoothness. I want to make sure that the, uh, my controller on the airplane gives me a smooth ride. I think all these are, I think we can agree that all these are important properties. And furthermore, if possible, I wanna certify that my controller will guarantee to have these properties under some assumptions about the work uh, operating conditions. Um, skip that one. So uh, there are of course other uh, types of guarantees we want uh, in the context of things that look a lot different than airplanes. If you want an AI system that's doing automated decision-making for things that are societally relevant, like loan approval, you want to certify that it's fair. If you're doing uh, using AI for um, uh, automated investing, uh, like robo-investors, you wanna make sure that it can, it, you can certify its risk tolerance and so on and so forth. So these are all things that matter beyond just classification accuracy. And so to ground this, let me talk about one application first. That was a collaboration with ESPN and the Walt Disney Company on automated broadcast. The basic idea is that we have data from that tracks how a human broad, broadcaster captures the game footage in a way that's uh, aesthetically pleasing. And that's the raw data that we want to use to build an automated broadcasting policy that can be implemented on an autonomous robotic camera. There are two things that matter here. One is we wanna be able to imitate the human's decision-making as accurately as possible. That's the supervised signal. But also we wanna do so while guaranteeing smoothness. You don't wanna jitter around a lot because if you jitter too much, it leads to a very unpleasant viewing experience, even if it's largely accurate. And so that's what we did. 
And so we were, we superimposed our results uh, on our original gameplay footage so you can see what it might look like. So our approach is on the right and uh, more traditional baselines on the left. And so you can see that our approach is fairly accurate in terms of capturing the action and also much smoother. It doesn't jitter around back and forth as much. And you could actually implement the behavior on the right on an autonomous robotic broadcast camera today. One of the fun things about this project was I believe this was the first time that a machine learning or artificial intelligence paper was covered on Sports Illustrated. Another application is in uh, agile robotic control. So here you see an example of a drone that's trying to fly in a very agile way close to a boundary condition. In this case, the boundary condition is the ground. And so one of the challenges of this type of application is that it's actually very hard to, to write out the, the equations of motion when a drone gets close to a boundary condition. All of our equations of motion uh, that we can use to model the aerodynamics of a drone or other aircrafts work best in open air environments where the drone is far away from any kind of boundary condition. If you've ever played around with your own drone that you bought one of the consumer drones, you'll notice that the drone has a lot of difficulty landing. What you often have to do is you have to fly the drone close to the ground and then just cut the power and it just falls awkwardly to the ground. Or you, uh, you, know, you, you grab the drone uh, in midair and then turn it off. So how this works, and again, you don't need to look at this equation. The, 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 this equation is a very standard equation of motion for drones, but there's we just added this one little thing at the end, this FA, that's actually a deep neural net that learns the interaction between the drone and a boundary condition such as the ground. And we collect data on a real drone by flying it close to the ground. To, to, to collect the training data to learn this FA. And then we just plug it into a standard drone controller. So everything, so my point in this slide is that everything is standard except for this one piece that we, that we collected data for. And now you can the result looks like this. This drone is flying with high precision close to a boundary condition such as the ground. This is uh, state of the art precision flying close to boundary conditions for consumer grade drones. Now, you're also, you, if you have a drone, you also probably read, read a warning that it sh you shouldn't fly close to anything, including other drones. And that the reason for that is that all of those things are boundary conditions. So if two drones fly close to each other, though they're, they're moving boundary conditions to each other. And you can destabilize the drone because it's, it, it perturbs the, the, the equations of motion used to design the controller for the drone. You use the same technique that I just described, but now train drones to model the perturbations to the equations of motion when other drones are nearby. And now you can get results where you can actually fly drones in a very agile way, really close to each other and still maintain stable control. So as was mentioned earlier, I'm, uh, I'm involved in a new center at Caltech called CAST, the Center for Autonomous Systems and Technology. And this research was done uh, through the support of CAST. So this type of uh, results that I just showed you would not be possible without using machine learning to characterize how boundary conditions, boundary conditions perturb the nominal equations of motion for things like drones. We can also do things like planning where drones know how to avoid collision and replan on the fly to avoid colliding. And the same techniques uh, can also be applied uh, to things other than drones. So I do a lot of collaboration with JPL, where we try to think about how to use machine learning to accelerate planning 
uh, for space assets such as the rovers. And so this type of planning is very expensive and the rovers tend to be very conservative. And you know, we can actually use AI to speed up the autonomy of rover path planning, which will of course, in the long run, speed up our ability to do science on Mars, which is the ultimate mission of the rovers. Even though the rovers spend a lot of time getting from point A to point B, their ultimate mission is to do science in the sites that were that have been planned out by the scientists. So this is a very exciting application. So to just to conclude, um, I I hope I've convinced you that there are many many exciting applications and possibilities when integrating machine learning and artificial intelligence into all these real world use cases. Um, ranging from things like content generation, such as in behavior analysis, which can be useful both for forecasting, such as in self-driving cars, and for, to be useful in various interactive gameplay experiences to make the gameplay feel more realistic. Things like uh, behavior analysis, where we actually look at large behavior data sets, such as this video of two mice, and be, help, the help the analysts, in this case a biologist, quickly annotate the behavior so they actually catalog what's going on in the science. To things like uh, repetitive, repetitive content generation, such as the, in, in the anim animation example I gave you, where we can easily, if we have the right data set, collect how lips move in response to spoken audio. And in, in some sense, it's a repetitive motion. It just, it just, it's just one that has a lot of variability, but it is repetitive. And so we, if we just collect enough data, we can train a deep neural net to be able to um, model all the re repetitive motion involved there. To examples where we have to model really complex structural domains, such as in earthquakes and in tissue analysis, where we need to be able to integrate very complicated data and make very complicated predictions, such as a tissue level prediction of, of where all the cells are and their spatial relationships to each other. To things like clinical therapy, where we don't have any data up front. We actually have to collect data by running experiments, in this case, on a human subject. And so we need to not only use this normal machine learning approaches that have become so popular commercially today, but also think about how to intelligently collect this data to make it actually the most useful thing possible. And so this has been very exciting as well. And in fact, it has many applications uh, with many of my science and engineering colleagues because none of them, or very few of them, uh, have the data that they want collected up front already. And finally, in the example on the bottom right, in autonomy, where you know, we want to put AI systems into real world robots and have them behave in, in ways that are provably safe uh, so that they can, you know, A, that they don't crash because the ro these robots can, can be expensive and B, that they don't harm humans. And so these are all the different applications. Uh, and there's, you know, of course, more that more to come that I haven't yet had a chance to talk about yet, so please stay tuned for that. And with that, I'll conclude my presentation. Thank you all for coming and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Isan, for this wonderful, wonderful talk this evening. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you all. And now members are welcome to exit and use the Zoom link to join us at the private Q&A. Both Isan and our Associate's Executive Director Catherine Reeves are there to greet you. And if you have any question, please email us at associates at caltech.edu. And finally, I want to thank all the guests for attending. If you enjoyed this evening's event, please continue engaging with us. Complete the survey at the end of the session so you can receive all the information about upcoming events and membership. And as um, year 2020 is close to an end, may I wish you all a safe, healthy, and joyous holiday. And we look forward to seeing all of you very soon in 2021. Thank you so much. <laughs>